All right, so keep your place in Acts chapter 26 and turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. So we're finishing up Colossians chapter 4 this evening, and we're going to go back to Acts chapter 26, but we've been spending several weeks in Colossians chapter 4. So we're going to finish it up this evening. Tonight we're going to talk about foundations. We're going to talk about Paul's foundations. We're going to talk about our uh, foundations, how Paul's foundations apply to our foundations. But before we get into um, that closing message that Paul has at the end of Colossians 4, let's finish up looking at a couple of the people that um, Paul is calling out here. So Paul um, we've been looking kind of at Team Paul here. We've been, you know, exploring some of the names that he's been bringing up at the end of the book of Colossians. Look down at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 11. He names a couple other people here, and we'll look at detail, especially at one of them. But look at verse number 11. He says, "In Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these are only my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort Unto me. So he names out this man called Jesus, or um, another name for that is Justice. This is not Jesus Christ. This is just um, another um, disciple who's helping out um, Paul. So, Justice, there's not a lot about um, Justice. We actually don't even really know um, which Justice this is. If you remember, after Judas Iscariot um, killed himself after he betrayed um, Christ, they, they chose uh, two men, Matthias and the other one, had a surname ma- named Justice in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 23. That could have been um, this man. Also in Acts 18, um, Paul runs across a man called Justice who was a, a believer as well. So that could have been um, you know, the Justice that we're talking about here. It just, just isn't much else talked about in the Bible about this man. In verse 12, uh, the Bible says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the word of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and to them that are in Laodicea and them in Heropolis. So this is another one of Paul's um, trusted messengers, Epaphras. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. He's also mentioned in Colossians chapter 1, where it says in verse number 7, As you learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So this is another man that Paul was using to tell the churches about his situation, and then he would also bring Paul a report back of how those churches were doing. Just another one of Paul's trusted team, his trusted members that were going out um, to you know, deliver his message and bring information back uh, to Paul. Because right? look, I mean, Paul needed information to know what to write in these letters to these churches. If you look at 1 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians, that's a great example of that. So these men were um, Paul's eyes and ears. Because where was Paul when he was writing this letter? You know, Paul was in, in bonds. We'll talk about that later. But now look at verse number 14 of Colossians chapter 4. And then he says in Luke chapter, in, uh, in Colossians chapter 4, 4, verse 14, he says, Luke, the beloved f- physician, and Demas greet you. So here he mentions Luke, who is the physician, and Luke is actually the author of the Gospel of Luke. Go figure, right? But a lot of people don't know that Luke also wrote the book of Acts, which is why we read um, a certain chapter from the book of Acts. So the point I want to make when talking about Luke this evening is we see that Paul had a team here that he would send people out. Paul was many times bound. He couldn't go places. It's not that he didn't want to visit everywhere, but he couldn't be everywhere at one time. And many times he was actually in prison. So he used people to go out, but God also used people like Luke to do a lot of the writing of the New Testament. Now, Luke was a very special person. Go to Acts chapter 27. Luke was a very... um, experienced person. Obviously, the Bible says here he was a physician, but my favorite chapter in the book of Acts is actually Acts chapter 27. And I want to show you um, tonight that I believe that Luke um, had a lot of life experience. I believe Luke was actually, um, he was either a sailor or he had much um, experience as a mariner. Because if you read Acts chapter 27, what we see in Acts chapter 27, we read Acts chapter 26 before the sermon, 
Acts chapter 26 is when Paul is in Caesarea. Paul is in Caesarea, which is right on the coast of Judea. It's northwest uh, of Jerusalem, but it's not across the Mediterranean Sea. And where did Paul want to go? Paul wanted to go to Rome, and he actually got to Rome. He got to Rome in Acts chapter 28. But to get to Rome from Caesarea is about a thousand mile trip across the Mediterranean Sea. That is a long voyage across a body of water. And if you read the details of Acts chapter 27, you can see that Luke was a very special writer. He was a very special writer. Luke writes like, um, like a detailed novelist. When you read Acts chapter 27, it's like you're there. It's like you can see yourself in, you know, the, you know writers that were like this that remind me of this are like, like Charles Dickens writes like this. If you ever read a Charles Dickens book, you can't read a Charles Dickens book like super fast because he's just, he's so detailed explaining. When you read a Charles Dickens book, you can see the people in the room. You can almost know what they look like. You can hear what they sound like. You can almost like get a feel for the, the scenes in a book like this. This is how Luke writes. And, and Luke 27 is a perfect example of this. So he traveled he traveled with Paul on Paul's second and third missionary journey. So, you know, he has a very good um, grasp of the book of Acts that he wrote. Now, look at the detail in Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. Just look at the detail. So here we see in Acts 27, we're, we're getting a, a, a story of this voyage that they took across the Mediterranean Sea trying to get to Rome. And if you look at the detail of Acts chapter 27, look down at verse number 9. It said, now, when much time was spent, when the sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. What Luke is saying here is that, you know, the season for sailing in this direction is over. And this is just a truth across the sea. It's known that in the fall towards the winter, you know, the, the seas get rougher. It's not a time to be out on large bodies of water. Then look at what he says in verse 13. He says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close to Crete. So what happened was, see, sailing back in this time, you had to have a wind behind you. You had to have a wind that was either that was coming behind you in some way. There was no way to sail into the wind until like the 6th century when they invented the keel, and that's a whole other thing. But the point is, they had to wait for the wind to be right. And Paul here is, or I'm sorry, Luke is explaining that the time for that wind had passed, but then they got a south wind, and they're like, yay, we can make it. And Paul's warning them against it. But Luke is saying a south wind meaning a wind from the south, because they have to travel, you know, they have to travel upwards to Italy. It's not just straight west, it's northwest is where they have to go. So a south wind is a wind that is blowing north. So he's very detailed with his, his description of what happened here. Look down at verse uh, number 15. The Bible says in Acts 27, 15, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. What he's saying here, see this is the sailor in Luke talking. He's saying the ship was caught the wind changed, and we couldn't sail. Uh, you know, we couldn't sail because the wind was against us. And he's like, we let the ship drive, meaning we were being pushed by the wind, is what he's saying, and we're being pushed in the wrong direction. Look down at verse number 17. Now he gets into some real detail here that shows you that Luke, he, he's either done this before or he knows what's happening, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. So they got into a, a contrary wind to the way they wanted to go, and what they did was they strake the sails. I mean, modern uh, sailors would call this reefing the sails. What they did was they bring the sails down to a minimal um, surface area, and that's how you sail in a storm. So you not just have no sails and just being pushed any way you want. They're still sailing to a degree, but they've taken the sails down to a minimum so they're not you know, pushed over by the wind. So Luke knows what he's talking about. He's, he's a very detailed um, writer here when it comes to this, this maritime event that they're going through. And then look what he says in uh, verse number 16 or 17. He says, 
that they should fall into the quicksands. What he's talking about here is the danger of being pushed onto a shoal. So what that, what's happening is they're being, they wanted to go from Caesarea up to Rome, and instead they're being pushed below, if you look at a map after the sermon, they're being pushed below these islands of, of Crete, these islands of Malta, and they're being pushed closer to uh, you know, North Africa, really is what it is, and there's shallows there. There's, if you look this up, there's many shallows and shoals in that area. Now, what's dangerous for a ship, you would think in high seas, you know, in bad seas, you want to get close to shore. But actually, that's not what you want. In, in bad weather, in bad seas, the shore, especially getting beached on a shoal, is extremely dangerous, and it will break apart the ship, which is why he's saying they undergirded the ship here. What they did was they literally took ropes, and they went underneath the ship, and they tied the ship together in case they would get caught up on one of these shoals and the waves would beat the ship to pieces. They were, they were trying to hold the ship together. And then if you read the rest of the chapter, they're throwing things out of the ship. They're throwing things out of the ship so the draft of the ship will be less and they can ride higher in the water and they won't get caught up on one of these shoals. Luke knows what he's talking about here. Luke is, you know, a very educated man, a very experienced man, and he was, you know, he was very, you know, in tune to this story, and, you know, he was also there. But he knew what was happening when this was going on. I remember Garrett and I, when Garrett was about six years old, we were on a kayak trip on the Missouri River. And it was really, it was really rough. Now, the Missouri River in North Dakota is different than the rivers that you have in California. Rivers you have in California are, they're fast moving, they're smaller. The Missouri River at places is over a half mile wide. So it's almost like being on uh, you know, a large body of water that's moving at six or seven miles an hour because of the current. Well, what happened was we actually got in kind of a rainstorm and we were okay. We had you know, our rain gear on and everything and everything was covered, but we got caught up on a sandbar in this storm and that's when the trouble really set in. We got caught up on a sandbar out in the middle of a half mile wide river. And everything's fine, you're going with the waves, everything's good. We got caught up on a shoal and the waves just beat, they beat our gear off of the kayak. It was, I mean, it was a, you know, a fairly scary situation. You know? So once we got off the shoal, everything was fine. But this is what they're trying to avoid right here, is getting hung up and then the boat gets beat to pieces. So they're undergirding the ship, they're offloading. I mean, they got to the point where they were literally throwing the tackle. They were literally throwing the blocks and the pulleys and the gear that they used to sail off of the ship to, to stop this disaster from happening. He talks about sounding. He talks about sounding for depth, how they could see you know, how close they were getting to shore. If you look down at verse number 28, he says, and we sounded and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. A fathom is six feet. You know, the only person that talks in fathoms, by the way, is a sailor. Okay, you don't talk in fathoms as a normal person. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. What they're doing is they're dropping a weight on a rope and they're seeing how deep the water is. They're seeing how, are, they, are we going towards shore? Are we going away from shore? So they're saying we're 120 feet deep. Then we're 100 and, you know, what is it, 90 feet deep. So they're seeing that they're closer to shore, and then they start throwing out the anchors. So Luke is, is, is a very educated man. He's a very experienced person, and he just writes a great narrative in the Bible for us here. So we see that men were used by Paul. Men were used by God to help Paul, not only as a messenger, but also as writers. You know, a lot of times we give... Um, Paul, um, credit for, you know, he wrote much of the New Testament, but Luke is also a great writer, a great experienced person. You can see in Acts 27 especially why God used him um, to write Acts and to write the Gospel of Luke. Go back to Colossians. Um, go back to Colossians. He gives great detail of that in, in, in endeavor. I love writing like that. It almost, it almost puts you there when you're reading um, things like that. Look at um, Colossians chapter 1, and, or I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 4, and look at verse number 15. Colossians chapter 4, moving through, look at verse number 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. 
And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So look, this is proving. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This right here, this is a great little verse because this proves that all Scripture is profitable for us. You know, he's saying, hey, take this letter that I'm, re that I'm writing to you, the Colossians, and share it with the other church. Share it with them. And then I wrote them a letter. Share that with you. He's saying all Scripture is profitable for you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 16. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this is just, this is just total proof right here that the Bible, look, the Bible's greatest miracle is that it's the only book that's ever been written that applies to everybody that's ever lived at all times. There's no other book that you could say that about. Now what people will do what people will do when they're trying to you know, either push a false doctrine or what many churches today, many liberal churches, that they don't want to take the Bible. They don't want to like, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that just kind of make people today be like, eh. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible like, you know, Romans 1. You know, like that, you know, homosexuality and perversion and all these people, they've been rejected by God. People don't want to hear that today. So what people will do, how about this one? How about, you know, how a proper family is supposed to be structured, that a man is supposed to lead his home, you know, that a woman is supposed to submit to her husband. Look, these are things that just, they're not real popular today. And what people will do in, in liberal churches, churches that don't want to preach the whole counsel of God, is they will just say, well, you know, those things, there, there was, that was the culture back then. You know, that, that doesn't really apply to us because that's just kind of the culture that they had. Look, what they do is, what they do is they remove the Bible's greatest miracle. They remove the power of the Bible. They're just coming up with reasons to not literally believe the Word of God is what they're doing. They're undoing the power of the Word of God is what people are doing. Paul here is saying, hey, this is profitable for everybody. This is profitable for the other churches. The letters I wrote them, they're profitable for you. It's like all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's the greatest miracle of God's Word is that it applies to everyone. Look down at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 17. Look, the Bible should be taken literally unless it's completely obvious that it's not Amen. to be literal. You know, like I am the bread of life. Jesus is talking, he's talking as a, as a metaphor there. He's talking, you know, figuratively in that sense. And everyone's like, what? Jesus is a loaf of bread? You know, the Catholics still think Jesus is a loaf of bread. The Bible says all kinds of things many times. We talked about 1 Peter 3, where it says, you know, the like figure unto. You know, in those cases, God is using, you know, metaphors. He's using analogies. He's using things that aren't to be taken literally. But otherwise, this is a literal book. This book is to be taken literally by us. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. The Bible says, and now we see somebody else. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So we've heard of this guy before. Remember Philemon? You can go back to Philemon, or I can just read it for you. He says that Archippus is this guy that is in, that is in Philemon's house. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. This is more evidence in verse 17 that the church in Philemon's house is the church at Colossae that they're the same thing. So there's basically two verses that prove that to us. This is the second one that we see, is that this Archippus, he's speaking to him as he speaks, as he writes the letter to the Colossians church, and Archippus is in the church in Philemon's house. So that shows you that Philemon, the church of Colossae, probably the same things. All right, But look, what is he telling this guy? What is he telling this guy? He's telling this guy. So, you know, we don't know a lot about this guy either, but we know that, you know, he wants to go into the ministry. It says, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received, or he has some ministry in front of him. So he's just saying, take heed to the ministry to fulfill it. You know, this is a man that's heading into some kind of ministry. He's either training for the ministry, wants to be a, a pastor, whatever it is, but he's saying, take heed. He's like, pay attention to that. 
He's like, keep focused on that. He's telling Archippus, keep focused on the ministry that you want to go into. He's like, don't get distracted. Why? So you can fulfill it. He's like, so you can actually do it. Did you know that we need more ministers of the gospel? You know, this is no different than it is today. This also applies to us. We need more ministers of the gospel. The world needs more pastors that are preaching the true word of God, that are preaching the whole counsel of God. He's just saying, look, look, man, he's like, keep your eye on the prize so you can fulfill, you know, this ministry that's in front of you, you know, and watch yourself. Take heed, he's saying. Look at verse number 18. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 18. Now, now Paul ends. And he says, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. He's saying goodbye to them. He says, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. So he says the salutation of me, Paul. And then he puts in this, this phrase. right in the, He sandwiches this phrase right in his final sentence to this church. He's just given one of the, the greatest epistles on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 and chapter 4 talks about our relations with each other, our relations with our employers, our relations with everybody around us. Colossians, these four chapters in Colossians are, 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 a, are a very complete message to the Christian and how you should prosecute this life. And then look what he says. He says, remember my bonds. He says, remember, I'm in prison. What, what does he mean? He leaves them with these words. What is he saying? Like, break me out? Like, get a posse together and come get me? I mean, what, what, is, what is he saying? What is he saying? Well, I mean, he's probably saying, pray for me. You know, you could probably assume that. But turn to Philippians chapter 1. He's saying much more than that by this. And we can tell by things that he's written elsewhere. Look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 14. He says, remember my bonds. He says, remember that I'm in prison is the final thing that he leaves them with. Look at verse 14 of Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This is what he's saying. He, he's, not saying he's not saying they're confident because they're in prison. He's saying, the brethren in the Lord, they are waxing confident because I'm in prison, is what Paul is saying. He's saying, be strong through my prison. Be strong through my suffering, is what Paul is saying. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. He, look, he, look what he's saying. he's saying. He's like, look, if I can do it, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You have to remember this about Paul. You know, what would, your, what would your Christian life look like if you were thrown in prison for your Christian life? If it suddenly became a law in the United States, if you go to Hold Fast Baptist Church, you will be arrested. And then you were arrested because you came here. What would your life look like the next day as you sat in jail? As you sat in prison, what would you do? Look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 9. Look what Paul says here. He's in prison again. The guy's in prison a lot. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. He's like, I'm in prison. But guess what? But the word of God is not bound. He's still preaching. That's why we read Acts chapter 26. Go back there. Go back to Acts chapter 26. Paul preached to King Agrippa while he was in bonds. While he was in prison. Look, he wasn't just writing in prison. He was preaching in prison. Is that what you would be doing? Would you be sitting in prison for going to church, for preaching the Word of God, for going out soul winning? Would you be preaching the next day? That's what Paul was doing. He's still preaching. Look at verse number 1 of Acts 26. He says, Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Especially, and you'll notice, the reason that he gives the message like that he gives to King Agrippa is because of verse number three. You say, this sounds like a different soul winning message than the one that we go through. 
But look at verse number three. He knew that King Agrippa was a Jew. And he knew that King Agrippa knew the prophecies of the coming Messiah. And he knew all this. That's why he asked King Agrippa at the end. He's like, believe thou the prophets? He's like, do you believe the prophets? Because the Christ that I just preached to you has come. Look at verse 3. Especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. He's like, hear me out. I know you know everything about the Jewish religion. You know, the, you, know, you know what the Bible says about this. Then he preaches Jesus to him in bonds, in prison. Look at verse 27. For sake of time, skip down to verse number 27. He says, King Agrippa, what does he say? He's like, believest thou the prophets? He just gave this powerful witness on how Jesus literally knocked him off his horse. He was persecuting the Christians, and it, and it was Jesus. If you have a red-letter Bible... The words in Acts chapter 26, they're red because that's what Jesus said to Paul. Those are Jesus' exact words to Paul. Look at verse 27. King Agrippa, believe thou the prophets. I know that thou believest. He's saying, do you believe the prophecies that the Bible says about the coming Messiah? He says, I know you believe them. The only question is whether or not he believes Jesus is that Messiah. Now look at verse 28. Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. So at that point, he's thinking about it. He's like, you've almost persuaded me. But look, the point is, Paul is still preaching in prison. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Paul's in bonds. He is still preaching to actual people to their face. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse number 20. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 20. Look what, he, look what Paul says. He says, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He's like, I am a messenger of Christ in prison. This, this is what Paul is saying. Remember my bonds. This, look, being in prison didn't stop Paul. He could have been like, man, you got me. You got me. Somebody else is going to have to carry this football. Somebody else is going to have to do all this work. But being in prison did not stop Paul. He just kept writing. He just kept sending people. He just kept receiving people. He just kept sending more people. Writing more. Receiving more. Writing, writing, writing. Writing and sending. Writing and sending. Preaching to people. Nothing would knock this guy off his horse. And ultimately, that's what made him so great in the Bible right there, is that he just, he couldn't be stopped. He couldn't be stopped. He wouldn't be stopped until his life was ended. And the Bible doesn't give us that narrative, but I believe his life was ended eventually. So what profit can we take from this tonight? On a Wednesday night, looking at the Bible, what profit can we take from remembering Paul's bonds? What can stop you? This is what he means by remember my bonds. He's preaching to them through letters. The guy in Colossae, as he says, remember my bonds, the guy in Colossae who's quitting the Christian life to please his family or friends or whatever it is, he must be feel pretty stupid when he reads that. Remember my bonds. The guy, the guy in Laodicea who's thinking about going into the ministry that drops out, not wanting to go, because he would just have an easier life if he didn't go into the ministry. He must feel pretty stupid when he reads, remember my bonds from Paul. This is why Paul said that. People like that wouldn't really like hearing those words. So the application that I want to just present to you this evening is that especially in this day and age, especially in this country, we are simply too comfortable in this life. We are, we are, we are without trouble in this life. And what that does, unfortunately, is it produces Christians. It produces Christians that are like, you know what, I'll do this as long as it's convenient. I'll do this as long as it's fun. Look, we, we like to do fun things here. We like to do activities here. We're going to go, we're going to blast off rockets, and we're going to build rockets, and there's always going to be fun Christian activities here. But look, you know, if that's why you're doing this Christian life, you're not going to last long. 
you're not going to last long. So how did he do it? How did he do it with all, without all this stuff? How did Paul keep going in the Christian life without rocket day? How did Paul keep going in the Christian life without pizza on Sunday night? Or without, you know, fishing trips? Or without, you know, fellowship? Or without all the, how, did, how did he keep going? How did he stay encouraged? He was in prison. I'm going to give you two, two ways he kept going tonight for you to think about. Two ways that Paul kept going, even though he was in bonds. The first one is this, and this is why I went through Team Paul. This is why we spent so many weeks talking about all the people that were helping Paul. First of all, he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. We've studied for the last several weeks all the people that Paul sent out and that came to Paul. Look, he couldn't do things, so he sent people to do them. He sent people to communicate for them. You think about Onesimus, Aristarchus, Marcus. Justice, Epaphras, Luke, all these people that helped carry the message, carry God's word with Paul. But still, even, even with all these people beside him and helping him, he could have stopped. He could have stopped. He could have just relied on these people to just, just handle it from there. The main reason, and, and point number two is what I want to spend some time on this evening, is this. Paul had his comfort sourced from the right place. Paul had his comfort sourced from the right place. I found a study um, on Americans that came out. It was like two, it's like two years old. But it was a study, and it's called Where Americans Get Comfort. Now, this is... These psychological studies and all these social studies, you know, I don't agree with the conclusions that they always come to. They always come to the wrong conclusions. But they do show some interesting statistics about the country that we live in. The, the article says this, or the study, the, the summary of the article says this. It says, Americans are getting more comfortable, but less happy. How is that possible? Americans are getting more comfortable but less happy. This is like over 25, 30 years, this study. It says, are we trading our happiness for modern comforts? As society is getting richer, people are getting unhappier, is the conclusion that this study came from. It's a paradox, they said. It's a paradox. A paradox is something that seems it doesn't make sense. You say, as we get more comfortable, I should be more happy, right? Isn't that why we go out and we buy stuff? Isn't that why we go out, we buy all these gadgets, we buy all these, you know, electronics, and we buy all this, you know, these fancy whatever's coffee machines that can drive you to work or whatever it is? Isn't that why we do this stuff? Because that is going to make me happy. If I just had the Ninja coffee machine, you know, it, it doesn't even make a very good cup of coffee. I don't know what to tell you. But the point is, I mean, isn't that what we're looking for when we go out and we buy all this stuff? We're on Amazon looking for this stuff. We're, but, but it's making Americans unhappier. Let me give you a couple stats from this study. It says new American homes in 2016 were 1,000 square feet larger than in 1973 as far as living space per person. On average, living space per person has nearly doubled since 1973. I mean, we're living in bigger houses. Isn't that what everybody wants? A bigger, nicer house? I mean, isn't that, like, isn't that everything? I mean, if I just had a bigger, nicer house, I would be happy. Isn't that the whole thing? It, or maybe it's just if I had a bigger, nicer house, I could show my buddy that I work with that, you know, I'm better than him. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But I digress. Here's some more stats. The number of Americans who use the Internet increased from 50 to 90 percent from 2000 to 2019. The percentage who use social media grew from 5 percent to 72 percent from 2015 to 2019. Don't get me started on that one. But amid these advances in quality of life across the income scale, this is advances of quality of life across the whole scale. It's not just like the middle class and the upper middle class and the upper class. It's like everybody is, is using the internet more. Everybody's on social media more. Everybody has a nicer toaster. Everybody's getting a nicer coffee maker. All these things. Yet we're getting unhappier. It's a steady decline in unhappiness since 1972. Isn't that crazy? Since 1972, the unhappiness is just going down and down and down. Why is this? The standard of living, this is what I'm talking about, standard of living, 
right? How, how expensive your car is, how big your house is, how, you know, all these, how many gadgets you have. This is standard of living. Yet our unhappiness is, is our happiness is dropping consistently across income scales. Why is this? Then the article goes on, you know, to draw all kinds of stupid conclusions on how capitalism is bad and we all need to be communists, right? But, I mean, forget that. The point is, the statistics are correct. They're taking polls of people that say, you know, these things don't make you happy. But look, Paul had the answer for this. Paul had the answer for this. Look, the three things that this study said that people rely on in this country, it, it's super interesting. First of all, the first thing was people. Pe you rely on people. You know, you rely on friends. You rely on family for your happiness. But, you know, you're like, okay, but here's the thing. Can I base my Christian life on a person? Look, people make me happy. I like my family, I like my brothers and sisters, Christ, look, that makes me happy. But can I base my Christian life on a person? This is what Paul had right. Did Paul, did Paul have somebody in his life that said, you know what, if he quits, I quit? Paul didn't have anybody like that in his life. You know, basing your Christian life on a person, it may work for a little while. But here's the thing, people will let you down. That's the problem with people. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look, you know what? People let Paul down. People let Paul down. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse number 10. So this is the, this is the, you know, the subject is people. People are where, uh, you know, people base their comfort. It's is people. They base their comfort in their friends, in their family, in people in their lives. Look at verse uh, 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, For Demas, Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. So here's a guy that just, he abandoned Paul. But look, that, you know, I'm sure that didn't make Paul happy. I'm sure Paul was upset about that. I'm sure, you know, that was not a great day in Paul's life. But look, that did not knock Paul off his horse. The second thing that this article points out that people are looking for to make them happy, that doesn't seem to be working, are things. And that's interesting because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 10, it says, Demas forsake them for what? For stuff. For things in this world. For like, you know what, Paul? You know, this is rough, man. <laughs> Everybody wants to put us in jail. A lot of people want to kill us. He's like, you know what? I just want to go chill out and, you know, have a nice life. So Demas forsook him for that. It's just not going to work at all. But look at Philippians chapter 3 and uh, verse number 8. Paul did not have an issue with this <laughs> at all. Paul was completely past things. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8. So people rely on people. They rely on things to, to keep them happy. And it's not working. It's not working just as happiness goes in people's lives. But look at Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8. Here's where Paul was with stuff. He says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And look, he's saying, he's like, I can't, it's not like Paul is sitting here saying, like he's saying, I count all the things that I own, I count them as like they could just be gone tomorrow. That's what he says in this first part. But then he says in the second part, for whom I have suffered, the loss of all things. He's like, look, I counted all things but lost, and it's like, and then they all were lost. And do count them but dung, then I may win Christ. He's like, you know that ninja coffee maker, that's manure. He's like, you know, all these fancy things. He's like, you know, he's like, all this stuff that we have. And look, we all have stuff. And that's not the problem. The problem is if it all goes away, are you still preaching in prison? Is the question. But Paul was well past this. He had nothing. The third one was politicians. I won't even get into that. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So the point is this secular study says that a life of more comfort equals an America that's less happy. Look, I, you know, that's all statistical. That's all just polls by people. That's, that's actually true. I, look, I see that. You can see that. People are less happy and they have more stuff. But Paul's answer, this is how he did it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 3. He says, blessed be God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of what? The God of all comfort. He doesn't say the God of some comfort, the God of a lot of my comfort. He says, 
God is my comfort, is what he is saying here. God is all of my comfort. Turn to Psalm chapter 18. I'll read for you Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. He says, Come unto me, all ye, the, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Paul, he had help, he had people to rely on, but his comfort was all in the Lord. That's how he did it. That's how he did it, folks. Look at Psalm 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler. My, it means he's your defender. And the horn of my salvation and my high tower. God is your comfort, but God will also, God will also defend you. Amen. God will be there and He will fight for you. And this, look, all hope and trust in the Lord is the answer. In what? In His Word. Amen. In His Word. If it says it, believe it and do it. In His plan. I, I don't see His plan. Follow His Word. You don't have to see it. Even when you don't understand even when you don't understand, even when you can't see His plan as we talked about last week, His rules, even when you don't understand them. I don't know about all these standards. I don't know about all these things the Bible talks about. And nobody else is doing that. Follow it. Put your hope in the Word of God even when you don't understand it. And then He will be your buckler. He will be your defender. This is how Paul did it. This is how Paul did it when he was in prison. This is how Paul didn't quit the Christian life when he had nothing. All the way to the point of death. This is how Paul finished. Even through a difficult life filled with tribulation. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, or 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Go to Matthew chapter... You know, look, here, here's the thing. All the comforts, they become our problem. All the comforts, they become our problem. Go back, it's Matthew 7, I'm sorry. Matthew 7 and verse number 24. Matthew 7 and verse number 24. All the comforts actually that we're looking for to all the people, all the things, all the ideas or politics or whatever we think is going to make us happy. Man, if this guy could just get elected, I'll be happy. No. That is all false hope. And that's why nobody's happy. That's why happiness is going down. Paul's comfort was in the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. The Bible says this. It says, Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine. You know what that is? That's the word of God. Whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And then look at verse 25. And when the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. But look at verse 26. It says, Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, but relies on the people, the things, the politics, the whatever, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built, built his house upon the sand. But look at verse 27 again. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Notice here how in verse 25 and verse 27, the, the rains come. The rains come. It doesn't matter what you built your house on. The rain's coming. The flood's coming. It doesn't matter what you built your Christian life on, because the flood is coming to your Christian life. The flood, the rains, the rains came for both houses. The floods are coming to your life personally. The floods are coming to your family. The floods are coming to the church. The floods are coming in your life. And guess what? It will expose your foundations. The flood is, is, is inevitable. It happens to everybody in this story and the foundation will be exposed. I mean, this is why, like, this is right here, this is why some people make it and some don't. It's all about the foundation. This is why Paul made it. So yeah, Paul had support. But what he really had was a foundation in the Lord. And he literally cared about nothing else than that foundation. That's, why, that's, why, that's what he meant by remember my bonds. He says, remember my bonds. He's like, see my foundation? 
is what he's saying. Check your foundation. Remember, in this comfortable life that we're living, make sure that we have our foundation in the Lord. It's, look, it's tough. It's tough. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of thorns. There's a lot of things like Demas. There's a lot of things in the world. There's a lot of pretty glittery things to chase after, but your foundation must be solid because the flood is coming. It will come. Many floods will come throughout your Christian life. And if your foundation is not in the Lord, your house will fall. Let's bow our heads and have a word.